bread this morning. Yes. Amen. <laughs> the word of God is our bread. Amen. Here is um, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his uh, uh, disciple, and he said to them in um, chapter 11, verse 27, we'll go through to the very end, one to 30 verse, chapter 11, Matthew, chapter 11, starting at verse 27, it says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. And he to whom the Son will reveal him. Verse 20 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He was speaking to a group of people here that were weary and tired of life. And he was telling them, you need to come to me. You have labored in sin. You need to come to me. And lay aside your heavy laden. And I'll give you that rest. Verse 29 is what I like. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now this part kind of hold me right here. Learn of me. We know that Christ got all his instruction and in teaching from his father because he said in many verses that the things that I learn and see, I do what my father has done. I, those are the things I do. He says, learn of me. He said, take my yoke. Now a yoke is something that they put around the ox neck to plow a field. And in the old, uh, in the old, uh, 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 the old uh, testament, the Lord told Moses, "Tell the children of Israel, don't put two different animals together. Don't yoke them together. You can't put an ox and a ass together to plow a field. You, you will have problems because it's unbalanced. One is stronger, and one is slower." One is slothful, I mean lazier, one is always on the move. So you can't be unequally yoked. Now he's saying here, our high priest who can be touched with the feeling of all of our infirmity, yes, taken on the form of a servant, so he knows what we are going through. So he says, take my yoke, because I know what you're going through. He says, learn of me, learn of me. He says, I want, want you to learn and look and see what I'm doing. How I walk in this world. How I live in this world. Learn of me. Amen. He says, for I am meek. I want, I, I want you to learn meekness. And lonely in heart. He says, I want you to learn these things. These things are powerful things. To be meek and lowly is a powerful thing. He said that in the heart. He said, I want you to learn this in your heart. I want you to put this in your heart. He says, and ye shall find what? Rest. Unto your soul. So rest comes through learning about Christ. Taking on the yoke of Christ, his lifestyle. And taking on and learn of him meekness, to be meek and humble. He says, learn that. Don't ask me to make you humble. I've learned that from a long time. I, I you know, I've heard a lot of people say, I always I pray and ask the Lord to humble me. I said, no, I'll never pray that prayer. <laughs> no, nope, I will not pray that prayer. No, I don't want the Lord. I'm not gonna pray, Lord, humble me, because if you put you through some stuff, I mean, you would break down and run away. Because, because if you ask Him to humble you, you are going to go through some stuff you have never been through. He'll put you through the test. But He's saying, learn of me, meekness. Learn of me how to be gentle. 
how to be kind. Learn of me how to treat people. Learn of me how to love people. And you'll find rest for your soul. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We know Christ's lifestyle is, 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 it, 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 is, it is light. It's not hard. But the Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. Amen. Not the life of Christ. Not his word. It is easy. So if we take upon him his yoke, we are yoked up with him. He will be gentle with us. He will be meek with us. But a lot of people don't understand. If you yoke up with sin, sin is not going to be meek and gentle with you. Sin will drag you around like a rag doll, telling you what to do, how to do. But Christ won't do that. He says, learn of me. Learn the way I do things. All right? So he says, learn of me and you will find rest. If we're looking for rest, let us learn of Christ. And when we learn of him, he will give us that rest that we need. He'll give us that peace. He, we will get that joy because we are learning from the master. Let's go to uh, 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 Proverbs 8. It's not a verse 6. It says, listen, for I will speak noble things. And the opening of my lips will reveal right things. For my mouth will utter truth. He's telling us the truth this morning. Learn of me. Because I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the light. Learn of me. And wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the utterance of my mouth are in righteousness. That's why I say learn of me. Because what comes out of Christ is righteousness. What comes out of Christ is what the Father teach him. And we know that the Father is righteous and holy in all his way. Amen? Yeah. All the utterance of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. All of what Jesus Christ wants us to learn is walking in truth. It is truth. It is truth. He says, learn of me how to live right. Learn of me how to live holy. Learn of me. Because I'm your example. He is the author and the finish of our faith. And all we got to do is learn of him. He promised to take care of it, but we got to learn of him. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you. He says, learn of me. Take my yoke upon you. Because I am meek and lowly gentle of heart i'm loving and kind and merciful learn these things from me and we'll find rest for our soul amen mm -hmm. yeah in matthew in matthew chapter 12 and 20 if you go up to about uh verse 8 and I'm going to kind of just skim through it. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into the synagogue. There was a man who had a withered hand. Um, verse oh, well, 10. And they questioned Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so they might accuse him? And when he said to them, and Jesus said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will he not take hold of it and lift it up? How much more valuable then is the man than the sheep? So then, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, stretch forth your hands. Well, that upset the Pharisees, verse 14. But then Jesus, being aware of this, withdrew himself from there. Many people followed him and he healed them all. Then, verse 7, he quotes that passage out of Isaiah. Right In this context, he quotes that passage. This was to fulfill. He, he healed them all. 
He left the Pharisees, took those who were hungry for the word away from the Pharisees, and then healed them all privately. Then, verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. Behold, my servant whom I've chosen, and it is a prophecy of Jesus. You mentioned that earlier, a prophecy of the Christ. He will not quarrel, he will not cry out. A battered reed he will not break off, and a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory. So he's, he's actually quoting that passage of Isaiah 42. But the reason is what he's getting at when he quotes that passage, a battered reed he will not break off, is Israel was, a ba Israel was battered. They had been overwhelmed by carnal-minded leadership of the Pharisees for, for spiritually for such a long time. And so, but then there's two different people that, that you constantly see Jesus ministering to two different groups of people with two very different mentalities. When he dealt with the Pharisees, it was always so harsh. Hypocrites, vipers, full of... Uh, Whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. He was constantly harsh with the Pharisees because they were the ones who were responsible for encapsulating the people in this foolishness, this bondage, this just going through the motions of religious traditions. So when Jesus came, he dealt harsh with the Pharisees, but the people he always dealt so softly with. Like even the woman caught in adultery. They brought her to Jesus. Moses said that this woman should be stoned. What do you say? And then Jesus responded, let you who's without sin cast the first stone at her. Right? So he's dealing with, that they wouldn't have anything to do with Zacchaeus. He was, a, he was a tax collector. Nothing to do with him. Jesus goes to his house and eats dinner with him. Mary Magdalene, prostitute. Nobody wants anything to do with her. Jesus is hanging out with her all the time. So Jesus separated the, the Pharisees, the religious people, from the, the normal people of Israel. And though Israel was broken... What, what this passage is saying is I'm not going to completely cut off Israel. I'm just going to completely cut off their carnal leadership. And I'll take the people out of them who can be healed, who want to be healed. Right? So in, in, in light of that, read through that verse again. A battered reed he will not break off. So Israel has been battered. The people have been oppressed by carnal-minded leadership for so long, but just because they're battered, he's not going to break them off, right? And a smoldering wick, he will not put out. They're not on fire for God anymore. It's just, what's left is just a smoldering passion for God that has been attacked by the, the religious traditions of the Pharisees and not really led by the Spirit of God. So Jesus said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to blow out and completely start over I'm not completely casting Israel away. I'm going to take out of Israel those who will receive me and I'm going to cast away all of those who do not receive me. Because remember Jesus says in another place um, that He would take the kingdom from Israel and He would give it to another who was more deserving. So like He's taking the bruised people of Israel who want to be healed, He's going to heal them. Right? That was the prophecy of the Messiah. That's how he would operate. He isn't going to cut off Israel because they're broken. He's just going to get, a, get rid of the root cause of why they're broken and then heal them. And then the next part of that speaks to his prophecy of going to the Gentiles. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. So like, that's how he's going to deal with Israel. But he's also going to then go to the Gentiles. Then Paul gets into Israel now is one new man. Both Jew and Gentile have been brought together in one man now. In one body. So this prophecy of Isaiah 42 is speaking of Christ, but it would also tell us his methods, how he would deal with the foolishness that was going on in Israel during his time and how he would heal it. Yeah, I, to me that is like people who are poor, he's speaking of um, social situations where people who are in leadership come and rob from the poor to feed themselves. Um, for lack of a better description, a Robin Hood type thing, but the reverse, 
where they're stealing from the poor to make themselves rich. And Solomon's addressing that concept because he's saying abundant food is in the fallow ground of the poor. In other words, in fallow ground being hard ground, if the poor were able to work and cultivate for themselves, they would be able to produce what they wanted to produce. But because uh, of the injustice of the wicked and those in authority and leadership, they come and steal that from them before it ever has... They have an opportunity to feed themselves. No, I think I think an issue here with the fallow ground is interesting. If you go to Proverbs, Proverbs twelve and eleven, kind of ties in with that same concept to me. He who tills his land will have plenty of bread, but he who pursues worthless things lacks sense. So, like. That's kind of the flip side of Proverbs 13. Sometimes people are, are being robbed from so they can't get where they need to go. Other times their land is there. They just need to work it themselves. And if they don't work it themselves, then they're going to pursue worthless things and not be able to produce what they want. So that's kind of the balance there in that situation, I feel like. So, all right, the Macedonian church had a need. And Paul then goes to the Corinthians telling the Corinthians Macedonia has a need and I'm asking that you consider giving to Macedonia. Right? And then he says prepare that gift before I get there so it doesn't cause any issues. Right? Then the, what you're having questions about I guess starts at 11. Is that right? You, speaking to the Corinthians, Corinthians, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality. In other words, when you give, God's going to give back to you because you've been liberal in your giving to others, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So in other words, Paul says, when you give to me, I'm going to give this to the Macedonians, right? So this gift that you give is through me. So which through, through us, through Paul and his ministry, is producing thanksgiving to God. So when Corinth gives to Paul and Paul gives to Macedonia, Macedonia then in turn gives, gives praise to God for supplying their particular need. In verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, not only are you supplying the need of the saints in Macedonia, but it is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. So not only are you supplying their needs, now they are supplying God's desire for people to praise Him. That, that thanks and that praise is going forth because, because you empowered them to be able to praise God. So it's like a cycle. Right? So you give to the saints. The saints give praise to God. God gives back to you everything you need to keep sowing into other people's lives. So it's like a cycle of... I, I feel like the reason Paul is stating this here is because when it comes to giving, we tend to think of it as all just self-centered. Like when I give, I lose something. Right? I'm going to lose something. We don't, view, we don't view it as an investment. Right? And that's the point Paul's trying to make is when you're willing to give to others, others then are going to give glory to God. So people's faith in God is blessed because of what you did for them. Now when people increase their faith and begin to praise God, God's going to reward you because the whole process started with you. So God is then going to come back on you and give seed to the sower. Whoever is willing to sow, God's going to make sure that you have plenty to be able to give to other people. But when we don't give, we stop that cycle. Right? And the wrong mentality of, well, I'm just losing this, whatever I'm giving, stops the cycle of God's blessings and people's faith being increased in God. But when we're willing to give, that cycle continues and flows how it should. So I feel like that's really the gist of what Paul's getting to in this passage is you got to think about giving with the right mentality. You're not losing something. You're investing into the kingdom of God. And God wants you to do it cheerfully without even giving consideration that you're giving. Like you're, you're, like you're not worried about it because after all, when you are faithful and you're giving like you're supposed to, God has got plenty of seed to give you back. 
it, he wants you to keep sowing and not storing it up and doing nothing with it. Um, just almost like giving with reckless abandonment, you know. I'm just you know, as quick as God downloads it or gives it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it away, give it away, and He'll just keep on giving you more seed. He does it too. I, I see it. I, I don't. I never cease to be amazed. That the people that give the most, God's constantly replenishing what they give. But people who don't give, they always lack. Always. Their money's like a bag put into a bag with holes. Just they're trying to hoard it all for themselves and there's a hole and it just runs out and they never can get everything together in their life. But it's the opposite with other people. People who give, God constantly rewards and replenishes what they give away just as fast or more than they can give it away. Give it away. It's almost like to the degree that you will give, God. it's almost like God saying, bet me, I can't outgive you. Yeah. You set your mind to give, and I will prove to you that you cannot outgive me. Yeah. Give, and it shall be given. That's what Jesus taught. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will God will cause men to give to your bosom. So when you give to others, God will cause wealth to start coming from an increase to start coming from all kinds of sources. He'll make sure that the giver never runs out of seed. But the person who's stingy will always have no seed to sow. I think about the mystery of godliness. What is it, Second Timothy? I think uh, talks about the mystery of godliness. You know, the carnal mind doesn't comprehend the things of God, but the spiritual mind does. And it's it's the glory of God to conceal the, those things, but it's the glory of kings to search those things out. It says in, in, in Proverbs, God wants us to seek after Him. So when we give, not only financially, but when we give and pour out what God has given to us, you know, and we're continuously seeking Him, He's got more He wants to give us. But He's looking at what you're doing, with what you got, and He wants you to not. Uh, to do it begrudgingly, but freely give to others and share with others His goodness. You, you know, share your testimony, share what God has downloaded in, into you, that He will give you more things. And and, and and I'm thinking righteousness, more teaching, more from God. To, to, to I want God to share more with me of how to re- live righteous and holy and pleasing to Him and do what He wants to do. And when I give freely, He'll continue to download as I seek Him. So it's not just financial. But at the same time, I'm, like the bishop said, I, I, I know people that uh, have known people all my life that, I mean, every time you turn around, they're given something that they have a possession or, or money all the time. And they don't even think about it. And they're like, well, you know, if I get it back, I get it back. If I don't, I don't. It wouldn't really mind anyway. God blessed me with that. And I, I found somebody in need and I'm going to help them out. And maybe it helped them to speak into their life. But it's just amazing, like you said, God gave them more. You know, He just kept giving them more. Uh, when much is given, much is required. When God downloads uh, a bunch of stuff in you or, or blesses you with a bunch of stuff, he, he wants you to, in turn, bless the body of Christ and give it out. Give it out freely without, without, without being uh, begrudging. Amen. Attitude is everything when it comes to giving. Right. It really is. Um, I look at Abraham. Uh, and the Lord, I promise to bless him. Uh, but he says to him, when I bless you, I want you to be a blessing. Look at uh, uh, Proverbs 21 and 13. He says, he who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be answered. So if you don't do what the Lord tells you, you're going to find yourself in a place that you need help and God not going to hear you because you need we are workers together doing good works in the in the book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy 8 and 8 he says uh, but you shall remember the Lord your the God for it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth that he may confirm his covenant which he has sworn to your father as it is this day. When God bless us, he bless us to bless other, others to give. Because it is through our blessing uh, uh, the, the uh, ministry grow. 
is through our uh, giving uh, people will praise God and they would say yes God is real God loves me God will take care of me when we shut up our bowels of mercy then what do we expect and people going to cry out and say where is God but God love is in us for us to demonstrate that before the people to this statement that Jesus made is the question in verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? And then Jesus goes into, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn um, as long as the bridegroom's with them, but the day will come when they were t the bridegroom's taken away and they will fast. And then he explains what he's why he said that like they're not going to fast now but they're going to fast later but no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment worse tear results nor do men put old wine new wine into old wine skins what, what he's saying is i can't put my spirit into what the pharisees have got going on this is this really ties in a lot with the, the matthew 12 dynamic of Jesus dealing with the Jews. He's like, I can, I'm not going to pour out the Spirit on this mess that the Pharisees have created. I'm, I, I can't do it. I can't put my Spirit and their heart's not right. Their mind's not right. I can't anoint them with my Spirit. It's not going to work. So what we got to do is put new wine into new wine skins. So I'm going to take out of Israel everybody who's not like the Pharisees. I'll, I, there'll be a remnant that's saved out of Israel. In that new remnant, those are new wine skins. They're not the same mindset, the same mentality as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the religious people. They're a new wine skin. So I'm going to put my new wine into new wine skins. Right? That's the only way it'll work is what really Jesus is saying. So in, in other words, to sum it up, I refuse to put my spirit in the Pharisees. Right. I'm going to wait till somebody more worthy of my spirit presents themselves. Those who walk in faith and obedience to God instead of religious rituals, traditions, the traditions of men. I, when I find people worthy, then I'll let my spirit be poured out upon them. That, I feel like that encapsulates the idea that Jesus is presenting here in this passage. And the reason I asked about, are you asking about the physical dynamics of wineskin? Like what James brings up reminds me of that. Like if you put new wine into an old wineskin, the old wineskin doesn't stretch anymore. It's fixed. So if you put new wine into an old wineskin, the, the wine is going to move and, and eventually break the, the, the container. And so Jesus is saying, if I was to put my spirit in what the Pharisees have got going, they're so rigid. They're so sold on their traditions of men. They don't want to change. They don't want to repent. So if I put my spirit inside of them, all it's going to do is cause a mess. But if I can find people who are pliable, who, who aren't so staunch and doing things a certain way, right? Because they're constantly getting on Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, for eating grains of corn on the Sabbath. Just all kinds of foolishness. Why not washing? Yeah, or washing? Not washing your hands? Yeah, constantly just traditions of men. And Jesus is saying they're so rigid and set in their ways that I'm not going to put my spirit inside of them. I, I will do away with them, and I'll find somebody who's worthy, somebody who can be molded, shaped, pliable. Then I'll put my spirit in them. That's what the apostles were, right? Case in point, apostles. These were fishermen. Right? These weren't learned religious. These guys didn't graduate from seminary. That's right. These guys were average Joes. Right? But when, when they came in contact with Jesus and they heard what he had was offering, they were like, I, I want that. So they didn't have to worry about coming out of a religious system or structure. They just came to Jesus as a new wineskin and boom, he put his spirit in them and the rest is history. So that, that to me is that dynamic that Jesus is encapsulating in this passage. The scripture says that and they that are hungry and thirsty shall be filled. The scribes and the Pharisees were never hungry. Weren't hungry for Jesus Christ at all. They all already was filled up with the, with the custom and tradition of men. So and they were never hungry for him. So he couldn't fill them. They had to empty themselves first to fill them. 
Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. So when God gave Christ, He literally gave first what He had created first. And he gave that to us. Gave His best. Yeah, gave His best. It's the only thing He would have gave. He could use it. He can handle it. gave us his best. He put his love in his son and gave us. Take it. It's my love to you. A lot of people, you know, preach or say, you know, bless me so you can be blessed. I mean, that, that's really the wrong outlook. If you if you get up in the, in, in the morning, maybe you've got, maybe you're full of joy in the morning. Lord, how can I use this joy to bless somebody else? You know, maybe you've got a lot of love to give. How, how can I show my love to someone else? Show the love of Christ to someone else today. Uh, God gives you wisdom. You know, how can I impart this to somebody else? Whatever I've got, Lord, how can you how can you help me to give that? Put me in front of somebody today that I can help with what you've given me. You know, always looking to, to, to pour out all the time. Not not store up, but just pour out all the time. And and you won't run out of stuff to give. God will keep giving it back to you. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, because we can't be God giving. That's right. We can't be God giving. He's giving all the time. It's a cycle of giving. So we can't be God giving. Don't, it doesn't matter what we have. It all come from you. Amen. So even 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 so, the scripture says that. Uh, the fruit of the spirit that we have that last week that is what we need to give fruit of the spirit we need to give that we need to share that daily with each other and with the world fruit of the spirit so why God gave us fruit of the spirit to give to win soul with it it's really is an economy well, I was thinking about what Elder Pierce just said whatever you you have an abundance of look to give that away and the reason for that is, is like if you wake up, what did, what, what did you say, joy. joy? If you wake up and you're full of joy, that should be your mindset is because I can guarantee you, you won't have to look far to find somebody who is lacking joy. Right? Somebody's bankrupt. That is, sometimes I feel like I'm bankrupt. If I, if I haven't been able to get my mind right and get in the presence of God, I feel like I'm bankrupt. I need somebody to come to me to show, sow some joy. But then the, here's the beauty of God's economy is like, Whereas a, a certain person may have joy and they have tons to give to other people, maybe they have no wisdom. Yeah. Like, have you seen people just happy and just make the stupidest choices? That, <laughs> right? They need somebody who has a who has wisdom, but the person with wisdom has no joy. Well, what is God's plan in that situation? That there be there, everybody's needs be supplied by one another. That's God's plan. So you impart joy. If somebody else imparts wisdom. Everybody has what they need. Nobody lacks, right? That's. But you got to have that mentality. What I have, I want to give it away. I'm not trying to hide it. I'm not trying to hoard it for myself. I'm not just trying to get through life by myself. I'm looking to impart this to somebody else. And when we don't have that mentality, we're all walking around bankrupt of something. We're tied together. God tied us together. We can't get out of this thing by ourselves. He has forced us to work together. That's the wisdom and the beauty of God. Everything we need, He's already provided it in the body somehow. Right? But when we try to live isolated from one another, we, we don't curse anybody but ourselves. Most we curse ourselves. And, and also, that is true riches though. Because you can't buy peace with money. Can't buy joy with money. Money can't give you that. Only God can. So we have the peace. Let's share the peace. You have joy, share the joy. You have love, share the love. Money can't buy that. I've seen rich folks have all the money to have all the joy and, peace and as miserable as a snagapus. <laughs> they put rope up around their neck and and swing and a bungee, trying to find joy, trying to find peace. And that money can't give him. A bungee jumping, yeah, that's joy. Yeah, it's end. What I do next? 
good and good. That's that real joy and peace. Mm -hmm. I was reading this the other day and it had me thinking. Look at, look at Acts chapter 2. Let's go to verse 44. When uh, Peter uh, preached the word and everything, and, er and, every and everything started to fall into place. Look what it says. It says in Acts, I'm going to start at first for the four, just quick. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and what? A possession. And were shearing them with all as anyone might have need. Look at it. Day by day, uh, continue with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Watch this now. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord had to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, you see the blessing of the Lord, what happened here? They started to give sheer stuff. And God started adding to the church. That's how the church grew in the, in those days. It didn't say one man just hoard up everything to himself and sit there on his chair, high and lifted up. It said that they give, they sold what they have and give it all. And because they did all this stuff, God started to add to the church. They started to praise God, and God started to add to the church. The church started to grow and grow and grow. Exceed. <laughs> it's, but uh, today it's not so. It's one man's sit on the seat. It says, I bring me your, uh, your offering and your tithe, and God will, will bless you. Yes. God will bless me when you start blessing me too. <laughs>